There is salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just a time we can come and gather together and praise your name. Lord, we thank you for the assurance that you do give us that you'll take us to heaven and forgive our sins. And now, Lord, I pray that you would bless our classes all over our building. Lord, I pray that you'd be with our missionaries. Lord, I pray that you would bless the offering that we're about to take for them. We'll ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I am on. Okay. And I wasn't sure if I was on yet. So let me just check and make sure this thing is working. There we go. Look at that. All right. I'll get this over here. I'll do this now so I don't have to do it when I'm up there and all of a sudden it doesn't seem to work in, in me. So, so well, that's good. I guess we're done. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, again. Um, we're going to continue on, and we've been going through the study. Of, we've been looking at Genesis, and if you want to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, I think we'll be able to get through Genesis chapter 2 today, at least that's what my, my plan is, but we'll see what happens. And uh, Genesis chapter 2, and uh, we're going to start at verse number 4. <laughs> I actually have those a couple of verses that we're going to be reading up up there, but you can also follow along in the Bible. But Genesis chapter chapter two, verse four: These are the generations of the heaven and the earth, and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer and then we'll uh, start into our, our study for this morning. Our Father, we do want to thank you for this time again you've given us, Lord. And, and Father, it's, uh, it's just a privilege to be able to to stand here and, and, and go through your word this morning, Lord, and I do ask for your help. And Father, I just pray that uh, the things that we talk about this morning uh, would be pleasing to you, Lord, uh, that I would not uh, interject or add anything that's, that's uh, not in your word. Father, so we need your help again this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 2, if you're all there. Uh, we just looked at a couple of things. So one a couple of things we want to just kind of observe as we go through and look at uh, chapter number two, starting with um, the idea, and we looked at this before, the idea of uh, Brother Steve's passing around the plate for uh, the missionaries that we support during this time. Um, but the idea of, of generations, that idea of what it means, generations, we're not going to go back through all the whole thing, but basically that Hebrew word for generations means uh, descent or um, uh, family or history. And in this course, case, what we're talking about in, in verse number four of chapter two, these are the generations of the heaven and the earth. We're talking about the history. So he's already, he's already um, played out in chapter one, talked about the whole history of, of creation in six days and in that seventh day of rest. 
So that's kind of the first part. That's really what we're talking about here when we refer to the generations of the heaven and the earth is really kind of looking back, if you will, onto chapter number one, where they go through the whole creation, starting from the creation of the heavens, the earth, all the, all the, the oceans, the seas, the land, and then the animals. And then that seventh day, we have uh, the day of rest that the Lord took. So that basically the six days of creation followed by that seventh day of rest. Of course, we won't go into all the, all the different types of theories that are in there, but basically we're just looking at what the Scripture talks about. Then we get into verse number 4, and verse number 4, really when you start looking at it, really starts to present a shift, if you will, shift in the focus. We're not so much concerned about, about uh, uh, creation in general or that whole process or what was created on what day and who was created and man and woman, all that kind of stuff, but now we're really starting to focus on man on man itself. And so when you start looking at Genesis chapter 2, especially from 4 to the end of that chapter, you'll notice that it's not exactly in the chronological order. It's not really in the same order as what we, what we saw in chapter 1. But that's not the purpose of chapter 2. The purpose of chapter 2 really is to present more detail regarding mankind. Right? And that's what we're going to see here. So the focus really is shifting from, gen from creation as, as a whole to really starting to focus on mankind. And then when you go into chapter 3, what happens? Sin is introduced into the world. right? And then the whole process really focuses narrowed narrow down to not just mankind, but eventually it's going to be Abraham and his seed, and then specifically Israel, and then Israel pretty much all the way through the Old Testament until we get to the... New Testament times. So that's kind of the process here as we look at, you know, almost like you're taking the big picture in chapter 1, 35,000 feet, and then you're coming down maybe about 10,000 feet we are here, and then as you get down, you're going to focus on really one family, that family of Adam and, and when sin comes into the world. So we uh, start to focus on these generations of, of Adam that we saw. Genesis, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 talks about that. This is the book of the generations of Adam. There are several times in the Old Testament in Genesis where it talks about this is the generation of, of uh, Seth. This is the generation of whoever after that uh, point, talking about this, the history of these families. And it, the other thing to really emphasize here, and it's, it gets criticized sometimes for a couple of things. There are a couple of things that go on. Some people take this as there is, there's a different account of creation going on here. And that gets back to these whole theories about moving you know, years in, to, in between verses, years in between chapters, and, and all of that. And, and so that's one of the things, one of the critical things about this. And the other critical thing is, is that it almost seems to contradict chapter 1. But it really doesn't, as we just mentioned. It, yes, it doesn't present in chronological, but that's not the focus or the intent. I hope that's. I think that's pro, that's pretty clear from that. So we have. Um, so we have the generations as kind of a summary, if you will, of what we saw in chapter number one. And then the focus starts to turn on to, really starts to narrow it down into an area that the Lord is going to work on and, and eventually bring about the man. But notice one thing that's kind of interesting. It says there was no rain at that time. There was no rain. There was no rain to water the plants. There was no rain to water the herbs. There was no rain. There wasn't the hydro hydrologic cycle that we see nowadays. That's even mentioned in the Bible where you have basically these oceans and seas and you have the currents and you have evaporation and you have transportation of the water in the mountains. And then because of the pressure differences and as you go up the mountains, the, 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 the clouds and the water vapor or whatever drops out as rain or snow in the mountains and it flows down the mountains. It forms the rivers. It forms... Uh, uh, springs and it keeps on going until it reaches back in the ocean. So you have this whole hydrologic cycle. That's not occurring at this time because there's no rain. But what we do see it, notice it says that God had not made it to rain yet. So we know that God is in control of that whole process. He's the one that set that process in motion. Just like when we talked about the first thing that God did, one of the first things he did was he created light. There was no sun, there was no moon, but he did create light. And so that whole universal process that we see about the rotation of the earth and around the sun and all those, those weren't created until later on, until several days later, right? And so God is in control of those processes too because he started all those processes. So we see that God is in control of all these things. Now, whether this means that 
we've talked a little bit about uh, was there some kind of a cloud cover that was uh, that where all this water vapor may have been stored? Maybe not. It's a possibility, but we did mention that before that if there was this great water vapor in the atmosphere above the atmosphere that eventually became part of this rain, there there's some problems with that. And part of the problem is with the UV rays that come down from the sun, it would have heated up the the earth such a high temperature that basically would have burned up or, or would have killed any living organism on the planet. So it's, 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 uh, that's, that does present a problem. So we'll just leave it at this, because this is what the Bible says. There was no rain. How did, how did the Lord water the ground? Well, it says a mist came up. Now, that mist I kind of envision, and I don't know, because I, like I said, the processes were much different than what they are today. Right? But I almost kind of envision when you walk out on the morning, whatever it's been, maybe it's been hot, it's been humid, and you walk out and you walk out on your lawn, and the lawn is it's wet, you know, from the dew or whatever. Or maybe there was a ground fog. You'd have walked out sometimes, and I think it's kind of neat sometimes. I don't like to drive through it every once in a while, but have you ever been driving and you, and you go through these, you're up on kind of thing, and you drop down into a little valley, and nice and clear, and all of a sudden you drop down, and there's just this ground fog. And so that's kind of what I get a picture of, in my mind, is a dew or some kind of this ground fog that the Lord used to water everything. And that was the process back then. Very different than today. Totally different than today. We'll get probably into that a little bit later when we start talking about the flood because it seems like after the flood, a lot of things changed in in the way the the whole processes were working. But we'll just leave it at this for right now. So there was no rain, and not only that, but there was no one to care for, as it talks about in the Scripture. There was no one to care for, no one to till the ground. Now, it's interesting because even when I'm doing this study, sometimes it's easy to kind of get lost in, in how many days we're talking about. Remember, we're only talking about six days. And literally at this point now, we're really only talking about maybe the last, last, the fifth and sixth day of creation. And possibly even now we're just narrowing it down to just that sixth day of creation when God created the animals and, and man. Of course, before that, he created the plants and then the fish and the birds and everything like that in the, in the, the previous days. But sometimes it's easy to lose track of that. And so that's one thing we want to just kind of remind ourselves that we're really just talking about this sixth day of creation as we start moving into the creation of man. And again, that was mentioned in chapter number one. So there was no one to care for God's creation. If you remember going back to chapter number one, one of the, one of the mandates or instructions, if you will, that God gave man at that time was to have dominion and to subdue the lands. We talked about what that meant. That really meant to be a good steward of the land, of the animals, of the resources that the Lord was providing for man to be a good steward of, to use it wisely, to to learn about it so that you can be able to better utilize those things. So there is nobody to do that yet. So now God is going to move into the creation of of man. And we see that in chapter number two again. We're looking at chapter number two. We've just gone through. So look up at uh, number seven. Chapter 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is really neat when you start taking a look at this, and it's easy to skim over this and, and maybe just read it. I've read it a thousand times, but when you start to study it out, man formed of the dust of the ground and breathed the nostril. That dust of the ground is similar elements to what the animals were created from, and maybe even the plants were created from. And, it, and that science has really borne that out, is that our, our bodies are made of the general, some of the similar compounds and elements that they find in earth. You know, a lot of, our, a lot of what we're made of is water, right? Water and then some of these other types of elements that we see. And so God is going to now, he's going to form them. And that idea to form means to mold into a form, especially as a potter. And so you get the idea of a potter who goes out and he has an area where he has some clay. And back in the day, I can have just imagined that this potter probably went out to his area and he got dug up all this clay and he brings it in and he, he puts some moisture in it because if, if you've ever dealt with clay and it doesn't have moisture, it is hard as rock, 
right? So he's adding moisture. He's kneading it, trying to get all that moisture worked into the clay all throughout all the clay so then that he can take that, put it on his wheel, and start molding it and fashioning it into maybe a pot. Or maybe it's an artisan who's going to make a statue of something, and so he's going to mold that thing into, that's almost what I get. It's almost like a Leonardo da Vinci or somebody like that, Michelangelo, who's coming with this thing, and he's making a statue of David or whatever. Right? And so that, in my mind, that's kind of what I get the idea, is that God is down there. You can just see it. Now, think about this. It talks about the animals and everything else. It's, it's like God spoke those things into existence. It's almost like God is in his third heaven, right? He's looking down on all of his creation. He's saying everything is good, but he spoke those things into existence, almost like he's a little kind of distant from it. But now we see God actually coming down, taking up some dirt. And I get this thing, and this is my mind, this way it works. I get this image of God coming down and actually picking up some of that soil, that clay, and he's going to add some water into it, and then he's going to mold or fashion it like a potter does. We get that same thing from Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, thou art our potter. That's that same word, and we are all the work of thy hand. This is a real personal thing that God is doing. This is not like the animals. Totally different, unique, very personalized thing that the Lord is doing here. God directly, and then he directly believes, believes, breathes, man, breathes, (laughs) there we go, breathes into the nostrils of man, the breath of life. Whereas before, now we know we have the animals receive that life, so to speak, that kind of that that consciousness that the animals received, but it wasn't directly, the God didn't take the animals, each animal, and breathe that life right into their nostrils, right? He spoke that into them. But here again, we see God personally working on man to make him in his image. The body of man at this time was complete. It was complete. It was... was, uh, had skin, had lungs, had all the organs, had the bones. Everything was complete. The only thing that wasn't complete in a man at that time is he was lifeless. He needed to be energized. He needed to be made alive, right? And so he was complete, but he was lifeless. And then he was energized with life from God. So man's, man's spirit of life came directly from God, not from any animal ancestry, Right? So again, I mean, I, I, I don't know, we'll, we'll kind of keep beating on this whole thing, right? Because when we talk about Scripture, Scripture is, you can't throw evolution into Scripture, right. especially the evolution of man, right. right? You just can't because man is a special, unique creation. When you start talking about that, the result of man becoming a living, that living, that's that word that we looked at before, soul, nephish. The spiritual, rational, um, immortal substance of man which distinguishes him from the brutes, the beasts. Uh, That part of man which enables him to think and reason. That's what that talking about that soul part of it. It refers to man's consciousness in the realm of mind and emotions. We learned a lot about that in RU, about the body, the soul, and the spirit, and that, that soul part being that whole thought about over where our emotions are in our, in our mind and everything. So the idea then, when you start putting all that together, when you start really taking a look at that, the idea is emphasize the special care and the personal, the personal um, attention God took in making man. Like I said, I don't know how God did it, but, but it seems to be really different because he just didn't speak it. He took of the dust. So I don't know. In my mind, and maybe this is, maybe this is not right, and, but I just see maybe God the Father or God the Son because certainly Jesus, God the Son, was involved in all creation. Nothing was made that was, nothing that was, made, that was made that was out him or however that verse goes. I just, I just slaughtered that verse. I apologize. But um, I just get this thing of that, you know, picking up this clay and actually molding it with his hands. And then taking that and breathing that life in his nostril, man. And then man became energized, became a living soul, living being with a body, with a soul, and with a spirit that separated him from all of the animals that were out there. Unlike the rest of creation in which God spoke into existence, mankind is unique and special creation of God. So now we go into, start looking at... uh, at, 
at Eden. Uh, pick up the account there in, in, in chapter 2, verse 8. Verse 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man with whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord, the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in sight and good for food, and a tree of life in the midst of the garden, and a tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'll stop there just for a minute. Notice that in verse 9 it says, And out of the ground, so he talks about, verse 8 it talks about, he planted this garden, he put man there, he's created man, we just read about that, and now he says, Out of the ground made the Lord God grow every tree. This appears to be, again, out of order. But it's not. He's just providing what the detail is there. He's not going back through the whole creation account. He's just saying this is what had happened at this point. And again, you can really kind of take a look at this as this is really almost like from man's perspective, if you will, um, taking a look at these things. All right, so verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. So we'll stop right there for a little bit. Let's take a look at what this means. So um, when we talk about what do we know about this, this, this place called Eden? Well, one, it's a, it's, a real, it's a real place, right? It's in Scripture. The Bible talks about a place called Eden, right? The only thing is, is we don't really know where, the, where Eden is. That, that location of Eden is a mystery, the Bible gives us, starts to give us some outline of it, and we'll start to take a little look at that, and we'll certainly look at it maybe a little bit later. But we're not really sure exactly where Eden is. And that's one of the things that people bring up all the time. The Bible, the Bible must be that some of this stuff must be a myth. One, because of the creation in six days. No way that could have ever happened, right? The other thing is because, uh, because Eden, you know, where's Eden? Show me Eden. If you show me where Eden is, I'll, I'll believe what the Scripture says. There's no Eden. Well, we'll take a little look at that in a little bit here as to what happened, what possibly happened to Eden. But the Bible says that Eden is a real place. It's an actual place. And we just don't know where it is right now. Does that mean that it's not real? Well, no. Let's say, take a look. Okay, so um, when we start taking a look at where Eden is, if we look at this map over here, so this being over here is Canaan or where Israel is. The Mediterranean Sea is over here, the Arabian Desert. Um, Iraq and, and Iran would be over here. Here's the Persian Gulf. Ur would be right around in here somewhere, and Babylon would be right around here, this being the Euphrates River, and this being the Tigris River. Okay, this whole area right here is called the Fertile Crescent right here. Very fertile because of the rivers of, of these right in here, very fertile. This being out here is all basically desert, very hot, dry desert. Okay, this, of course, if we were to go back and look at Abraham's life, this is where Abraham would have, would have left um, Ur of the Chaldees, would have migrated up into this area right here, and then eventually down into Canaan. So that kind of gives us an idea of what we're talking about. When you start taking a look at this, is there's really kind of two places where most people, uh, most theological um, scholars would believe that, that Eden would have been in one of two places. That's assuming that... Everything is pretty much looks at as it does today as it did back then, right? But we think there's probably some changes. So one of the places is right down here in the south, right around here where, where the rivers kind of come together. There's actually the Euphrates River comes here, the Tigris River comes in here, and then there are a couple other rivers that come, come in over here. So that is a possibility. We've got three different types of rivers. There's not a fourth, doesn't appear to be a fourth. We may take a little look at that a little bit later from some... <laughs> from some, uh, some deep, deep subsurface uh, geology stuff that was completed. But one of the issues I do have with that a little bit is one that uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, water should be flowing this direction, not this direction. So that's a minor issue. But things have changed. So that's a possibility. Okay, so Eden was down in here. Might make sense. We know that that's where Abraham was from. We know that a lot of uh, early civilizations were right in this area, so that could make sense. Another place is up here in these headwaters. This is actually the headwaters of the Euphrates here, the headwaters of the Tigris. There's some other headwaters that go off onto this way over to the Black Sea and over, over in this direction. That's another possibility. There are some rivers up there. Certainly if things have changed, if there's more mountain building and stuff, those mountains of, of where Ararat is and all those other mountains would probably were not there during this time. So, okay, so that's, that's a possibility. And certainly the water would flow in the right direction afterwards. So those are two possibilities. 
Again, now the, big, the main problem being is that we really have to remember that one, this is thousands of years ago, right? So there's a couple of things. So possibly whatever, it's that um, we have, this is from the pre-flood world, okay? The flood itself and other calamities in nature associated with the flood, earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, etc., dramatically changed the landscape of the earth. It is impossible to accurately locate exactly where Eden was or how large an area it took up based on the descriptions in Genesis 2 because the landmarks have all changed. I mean, when you think about it, I don't know, I, I don't know if you remember, I lived in California during uh, 1980, and uh, I was in college studying geology at the time, and one of the big events that happened was Mount St. Helens. And if you, it was, there's pictures of Mount St. Beautiful Mountain before it erupted. And when that thing erupted, it, was, it, was a, it, it just destroyed all the trees. Shelly and I went up there several, about four years afterwards. And you drive into that area, when you drove into that area, it's still at that time, nothing had started growing back at that time. Very little. I mean, it was like driving into a black and white photo. Everything, everything was gray. The trees were gray. The ground was covered with ash and gray. There was no color at all. It was the, it was the eerie thing. And everything, all the trees were just blown down in one direction, stripped completely of limbs and everything, just logs just laying down on the ground. The lake that was there was completely, was, um, completely filled with, with logs and debris. The river that was there was gone. The Spirit River was basically gone. And in its place now, there was, and we'll get into this maybe a little bit later, there was where all this ash and gravel had, had built up to, you know, 100 or more feet, and then the river carved right through it again, forming another, another river with these seemingly high cliffs, 100 of feet, 100 or more feet up in the air. And so it was like you're walking through this valley. And if you would have looked at that, look at it today, you would say that valley is probably millions of years old based on secular geology, Right? But it wasn't. It was formed in a matter of days. That's the kind, and that's just one volcanic activity. And you think about something like uh, some of these other ones, like Iceland and, um, and some of these other volcanoes that have, have erupted and just wiped, completely wiped out towns and cities and some of those things that they've been able to find, like Pompeii and, and some of these other areas. So things have changed. So a couple of things we can start taking a look at is when we look at this idea of the flood account, we get some, maybe some idea of what may have happened to this pre-flood, if you will, pre-flood environment at that time. The flood account. So if you look it over there, there's probably two, really kind of two explanations for what happened. And maybe they're really combined when we think about it. So one, Genesis 7, 11 through 12 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day, 17th day of the month, the same day were the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. This must have been probably a pretty heavy rainfall. And it says the rain was upon the earth. It was, this wasn't local. This was a, a whatever the land mass at that time, however it was created, whether it would look like it does today or whether it was one land mass, which I tend, in my, my opinion, I tend to believe, rain was upon the earth for 40 days. Think about what the floods in, in Florida from just one hurricane. The floods in Southern California from that tropical storm that went through there, that was just, what, a day or maybe too long. And all the water that came down. Think about the snow melt, the amount of snow that we had this last winter in the Sierras and some of the damage that it caused. Wiping out roads, wiping out rivers, wiping out homes, wiping out pretty much everything in their, in their path. Carrying not only small sand-sized particles and clay and stuff like that, but the power to move huge, huge boulders the sides of trucks. That's the kind of power that that type of rushing water can have as it moves and flows through. Certainly nothing could really stand in its way. So you have this idea of fountains of the great breed broken up. We don't really know exactly what that means, but it appears that there's some water or something at some depth that was superheated or maybe heated. Again, it's speculation. We're not really sure. And all of a sudden you have this water coming to the surface and it's breaking up the land. It's causing faults. It's causing earthquakes. It's causing the building of, um, of, the, of the, the earth and things like that. Great deeps. And then the windows of heaven. So you got the wind, water's coming down. You got these waters coming up. And then uh, go down to uh, verse 17 through 20. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted above the earth. And the waters prevailed, and there increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark 
went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under heaven were covered. So basically, again, we're talking about whatever the, whatever the mountains were at that time, or just hills, or if it was relatively flat, everything was covered by water, by this water, from the rain and from that coming up from the deep. That's a lot of water. But notice how many feet it says. It prevailed what? 22 feet. 22 feet of, I don't know, what, what's, what's the height of this roof right here? What did you say, 16, 17, 20 feet? I don't know, whatever it is. But, but think about it. I mean, we, it, it'd basically be covering, right, the whole earth, everything, above whatever the highest point, not just the lowest point, not just the local area, but the whole point would be completely under this amount of water. And then whatever valleys are there, of course, it'd be a lot deeper. There's interesting, there's a place in Northern California, it's called the Eel River. And uh, during the 60s, there's a huge rainfall event. And if you drive along Highway 101, Highway 101 is, is probably at least 100 feet or so above the river down there. When you're driving along there, you drive on the freeway, there's a sign up there. On that sign that sits up about six feet, they have a line. That was a high water mark during a flood that they had on the Eel River as a, as a result of the rains. 100 feet of water during going down that valley. So that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of power that you can get just from the water, just from the rains, amount of water that can generate just from a day or two or a week of, of constant rain. This is 40 days or whatever it was that it says on there, um, open the rain was upon 40 days. So that, that's how much rain it has. In verse number, or chapter number eight, and God remembered Noah and every living thing and the cattle that was with him in the ark and God made the wind to pass over the earth, watered a, a swage and Fountains of also the great deep, the windows were stopped, and the rain from heaven was strained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. So now what you have is you had this period where you possibly have some kind of mountain uh, forming process because these things are getting broken up. Again, this is my, my opinion here, and it's not just mine, it's just what I read from some of the creation geologists, but it, it does make sense. So you have these mountain building process. So as these mountains are running up and the water's starting, it's just flowing off, you get a lot of erosion. So all this erosion, these mountains are coming up quickly. There's this erosion, all this stuff is coming in, starting to, all the sediments filling in these valleys, and you get these big, thick sequences of, of sediment. We're going to take a little look at that a little bit later in a, more, a little bit more detail, hopefully, if we have some time. So going through it kind of fast. But basically, it's going to bury... Most everything, all the old valleys. So if Eden was in that fertile crescent area, which is a low area, most likely Eden, if it was there, might be under several thousand feet of sediment as a result of these activities. Or the earth had a different form at that time, and there's been a lot of movement and mountain building process, and so where Eden was is no longer even, we, you wouldn't even be able to find any, any aspect of it. 2 Peter 3.6 says, Whereby the world that, went, that then was, talking about prior to the flood, right, was being overflowed with water, perished. So basically what Peter is saying through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, whatever was there before the, the world, it basically perished. Now some people take that to mean that the people and the animals and things like that perish, which is certainly it does. But basically I think when he talks about the world, he's talking about the, basically the earth itself and the people and, and the animals and whatever life was on there except for those uh, that were in the ark with Noah and his family. It's complete destruction. So the other opinion there or the other option or maybe these are combined is that also after that flood event, which again, we believe that the flood event because scripture talks about the flood event because Christ mentions it, because it's mentioned in the New Testament, we believe that the flood event is an actual true event, a cataclysmic event that happened thousands of years ago, right? And there is a lot of evidence for a, a global flood. We'll look at that a little bit later when we get into that. So there's a lot of evidence for that global flood. So after that flood event, with all those processes going on, you also have all the natural processes that are occurring that we see even today. Volcanism, what it changes. 
erosion things that happen. Erosion from water, erosion from the ocean, erosion from wind. All these processes, these natural processes, um, earthquakes and landslides and all these things that are occurring today that are part of the earth processes. So certainly the flood and all the processes over the last hundred years certainly has changed the landscape of that whole area. And so now we're here we are today, looking back, trying to find it. So just because we can't find Eden right now does not mean that it did not exist at one time. The Bible says it's a place, so we believe that Eden to be true. All right, so Eden was an actual place, land or country, although the location remains a mystery, presumably lost during the flood and or years of geological and geomorphological changes to the earth. Geomorphology is just talking about the earth's surface and, and the, the, like landslides and all those kind of good things. All right, so what do we know about Eden then? So what we know about Eden, let's kind of focus now on what we really know. What does the scripture tell us about Eden? Where it is and, and what it was. So we, we have go to the next couple of verses here, and I highlighted some things. These are, this is really what we know about Eden. Genesis 2, 8 and 9 says, And Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden. There he put man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made uh, the Lord God grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, verses 10 through 14. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it parted and became four heads. Name of the first is Pishon, uh, that is which encompasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and the Benelum and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gikon, and the same that encompasses the whole area of Ethiopia. Ethiopia, the word, the Hebrew word there is actually Cush, but it is translated as Ethiopia. It's basically kind of the same area of, of now, what is now um, uh, Eastern Africa. And the name of the third, air, uh, third river is uh, Hideko, and that's believed to be the Tigris. And the reason why it's believed to be the Tigris is if you go to Assyrian uh, manuscripts, it talks about that river um, that's named that as also the Tigris River. So that's where they get that idea that it's most likely believed to be the Tigris River. That is which goes towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates, and that comes from the Persian word freight, and basically, you get that word. That's where the word Euphrates comes from. It's from the Persian uh, word for freight. So that's what we know right there. That's really all we know about Eden is right there in no scripture. Anything beyond that is speculation to some extent. I mean, you can go to some other verses, kind of get a little bit of idea. Like the word uh, Havila. That's used several times in the Old Testament. It refers to there's, there's several people that are named Havila, sons of of. Uh, Jacep and, and things like that. So that's one thing. But it also talks about Havila as a place being to the east or east of Israel. It's an area that's to the east, which kind of makes sense to some extent. And then Ethiopia is Cush. We already talked about that. That's the area when you start looking at that uh, the area of where um, Israel comes out of Egypt and some of the other places in the Old Testament that's talking about that area of really kind of eastern Africa, if you will, the Cushites, where the Cushites were from. All right, and then we have um, Assyria. We kind of know where Assyria is. That's north of Babylon area and kind of that Mesopotamia area. And then you have the river Euphrates. One thing we don't see, of course, we don't really see anymore. We have the name Euphrates River. That's still a river that's used today. And we also have the Tigris River. That's, that's, those two are obvious. The other two, they're, they're, uh, those two names are lost in, in the history somehow, either possibly as a result of the flood and they're no longer available, or they, if they are available, they've been renamed something else. There's a couple other rivers that are possible. Some people talk about the Ganges. Some of them say it's the Nile. Some of those don't make sense at all because they're way too far separated from, from anything that's today. So we're not really sure where those two rivers exist, if they do today, if they've been renamed, or if they're gone as a result of the actions in the flood and, and other activities going on. But we knew know where Assyria is. Uh, we know from history where that is. That's up in that northern Mesopotamia area. All right, so that's what we know. So when we start taking a look at it and we break it down, we know, one, that God planted a garden in Eden, 
right? So we talk about, sometimes we talk about this Genesis and we talk about the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden, right? And we think that just, this is just the thing. But actually what it is, Eden is a place, a country, a land itself. And then what God did was in Eden, he planted a garden, right? So you've got a garden inside Eden, so it's the Garden of Eden. So that's what we have there. He planted a garden in the land of Eden. The garden was, there's either two possibilities. Let's take a look at that, what it says there. Um, verse number eight, it says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. I think it's interesting, because notice what the scripture says. It says, there he put man. In other words, man was, he created man outside of the garden some place, right? Some place out of the garden. Maybe it was in Eden, or maybe it was even further outside of Eden itself, but notice he says that God placed man or put man in the garden. So man was originally outside of this garden. He wasn't created in the garden. He was created outside the garden. Now, from man's perspective, it could be like Adam's looking at it and saying, okay, the garden was east of me. It was in the eastern direction. It also could be that from Israel's perspective, because remember who's writing this is Moses is writing this, from the land of Israel, whenever they talk about that uh, Mesopotamian area, it's referred to as the east, it's always east over there. So from their perspective, it's anywhere that would be to the east. The other thing it could be is that the garden is in the eastern portion of, of Eden itself. It's picking at nits, I guess, nitpicking, <laughs> whatever. So you're not really sure exactly. But basically what we have is we have this idea that there's Eden, there's a garden inside that, and it was kind of east of something, most likely east of where Adam was. So from his perspective, um, so God either transported Adam to there, to the garden, or God instructed Adam, probably really what happened, God instructed Adam, similar to he did to Abraham, right? Abraham, I want you to get out of this country, and I want, to go, I want you to go to a country I'm going to show you. He probably told Adam, Adam, uh, I want you to go, and I want you to live, I want you to be in the garden, I want you to tend the garden. That's going to be your responsibility now, is to tend the garden, to take care of the garden that I've created. So Adam gets up. And it's just him, right, at this time. It's just Adam at this time. So Adam gets up, treks over, and he camps out inside the garden, and he's there in the garden. Remember, this is the sixth day still. This is all happening on the sixth day. This isn't a week later. This isn't two weeks later. How do we know? Because from chapter 1, it said that God created man and woman on the sixth day. So all this has to be happening on the sixth day, whatever, however long period that is. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so Adam now, he's in the garden, and he's hanging out in the garden. He's going to be, have his responsibility to take care of this garden that God has created, right? So notice that it says here that God placed also the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He placed a bunch of other trees in there, a bunch of other vegetation, all these things that were good for meat at that time, right? Adam, Adam was not permitted to eat animals at that time, right? Just the vegetation, in fact, I would believe that the animals were not permitted to eat the animals at this time, that they were also most likely vegetation. People come back and say, well, what about the teeth structure and the mouth structure of lions and all that? I don't know. I, I have no idea. I, I'm following what the scripture talks about. I'm following about what happened and different things. Um, but that's just what, what I think is probably most likely that those things didn't occur until after the fall of man. Okay, that's, that's my opinion based on some scriptural verses that we looked at before and based on what's going on. But regardless, man at this time was not permitted to eat the animals. He was to care for the animals. And so um, he was instructed to um, not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He, he, could still, he could eat of any tree in there in the garden. We all have heard this before. Even the tree of life. But the only tree he couldn't eat was that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right? So he couldn't eat of that one tree that was in there. Man, it's just like us, though, isn't it? Especially when we're kids. And, and you know, Adam, although he's probably, probably one of the smartest men that ever lived, probably one of the most intelligent men that ever lived, because God would have created him with that intelligence. He created in the image of God. I think we lost a lot of our smarts. I, there's smart people, don't get me wrong. I think we lost a lot of our intelligence and wisdom as a result of the fall of man. Right? And now we're, we're slowly gaining it back. But um, anyways, regardless, because you see some of the things that were created. So Adam was very, very smart. 
Um, but anyway, so, but he's, he's still only a day old, you know. <laughs> what do you expect from an infant, you know? <laughs> Anyways, that's kind of a joke. All right, so Adam is not uh, to eat that. So the garden, notice that also that the garden was watered um, by the river. Remember, there was no rain at this time. I think personally, the Bible doesn't specifically say that there was no rain at this time, but I really believe that that was probably the case. It doesn't indicate that it started raining. It doesn't indicate that those hydrologic processes had started. So I think the, I think the garden was watered and the area of Eden and whatever else was watered by this river. This is probably a really big river. It became really bi- four really big rivers. So this river, and we're going to have to stop right after this, so we're not going to get through chapter 2, like I thought. Anyways, um, so the garden was watered by an unnamed river. The river, the name of the river isn't named. Maybe we call it the, the River of Eden, but that would just, again, there's no name. And it flowed through, notice it flowed through Eden, and into the garden. So whether this river started in Eden, which is possible, it could have been some spring that um, started in Eden and started to flow out, or it originated outside of Eden, flowed into Eden, flowed into the garden, and then flowed out of the garden. We're not really sure, but basically there's a river that flows through Eden and into the garden, according to the scripture. Then after it flows out of the garden, the river is divided into four rivers, as it departs the garden, the rivers that we had already said. And let's take a look at that just so we can, we can see this. Um, verse 10, and a river went out of Eden. Okay, so we got a river that's going out of Eden um, to water the garden. So we've got a river going from Eden into the garden to water the garden. And from thence, from thence, from the garden, it parted and became four heads. Okay, so what we have then is we kind of look at, whoa, that green thing. Oh, that looks good up there, not back there. So there's, we don't really know exactly. These are just obviously cartoons of what possibly could have happened. So what we have is over here on this one, we have Eden, this area of Eden, right? We have the garden in Eden. In this case right here, we have it on the eastern side of, of Eden. And you have this river that's coming through Eden into the garden, flows out gets in Eden, and it separates into our four rivers with the the different areas named here. Another possibility is that you have Eden, you have a river that started in in Eden, like maybe as a spring or something, an artesian flow, and it flows out out of that into the garden, and then from there it goes out of the garden and it forms the four river heads. Both of those are, are possibilities. But that's what the scripture seems to indicate there as far as what's happening at that point. So um, let's see. Yeah, we'll go ahead and stop there because then we move on to the next section. So let's go ahead and, and we'll, we'll stop there. And next week we'll pick it up at, at um, uh, right there at verse number 18. So we'll talk a little bit more about, um, about the activities of man and uh, the creation of woman. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we do want to thank you for this time you've given us, Lord, and we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the truth of your word. We can, we can trust it, Lord, even today. And Father, um, we just pray as we get ready for service this morning that we would come with hearts prepared to hear what you have for us. And would you strengthen pastor this morning, give him the words to, to speak, Lord, may be led by your Holy Spirit. We thank you again for how much you love us. We love you, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.